QuickBooks Online 2024 Delayed Credit Form. Get ready and pack some trail mix because we're hiking on QuickBooks Online, our audit trail to success. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are online in our browser searching for QuickBooks Online test drive, looking for the result that has Intuit.com and the URL Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks, selecting the United States version of the software and verifying that we're not a robot opening up our major financial statement reports like we do every time reports on the left hand side we want to be in our favorites right clicking on the balance sheet to open link in new tab right click on the profit and loss to once again open link in new tab let's go to those links up top go into the middle tab closing the hamburger there is our balance sheet report tabbing to the right closing the hamburger there's our profit and loss report Let's go back to the first tab, and this is the setup process we do every time. We've got the first tab, data input tab, and then we're gonna look at the results on the reports in the right or on the right. Selecting the plus dropdown in prior presentations, we've been focusing in on the customer cycle, noting it will differ depending on the industry we are in. The easiest process being where you just depend on the bank feeds as the deposits come in, recording the income with the use of the deposit form, possibly useful if you have like a gig work scenario. If you're working at a cash register like a food truck or something, then you're still on a cash-based system getting paid at the same time you do the work, but you're probably gonna want to enter the sales receipts as they happen, then make the deposits and then match the deposits with the bank feeds and or bank reconciliation. If you're on an accrual system, you'll be entering the invoice and then you'll have to receive the payment record the deposit and then match the deposit with the bank feeds or with the bank reconciliation now we're looking at some of these forms which are more unusual in the process such as the credit memo that was the reversal oftentimes of an invoice so that shouldn't happen all the time but if the product was returned you might have the credit memo and we looked at a refund receipt that would be a situation where they have already paid and you're going to re they return the merchandise and then instead of issuing a credit memo you want to actually give them a check because you're going to have to pay them back for the money that they paid you because they returned the merchandise but you don't want to issue a check or a normal check or expense form because those are going to be connected to the vendor side of things and you want to be tying this onto the customer side of things therefore the refund receipt basically is a way to cut a check but be able to track it in the customer center as opposed to the vendor center so now we want to go into a delayed credit so let's take a look at this from a flowchart standpoint before we get into too much detail and recap the process i'm going to look at a quick quickbooks desktop flowchart but we're just looking at the flow of the forms which will in essence be the same for any kind of accounting software now if we have a full service accounting system a cruel accounting system we enter an invoice now, if we enter the invoice and then the customer comes back and returns the merchandise, that's where the credit memo fits in perfectly because that will reverse the, the uh, invoice, the sales and the accounts receivable. However, if they already paid us, then either they had an invoice and they paid us or we had a sale at our store, like we sold a guitar or something or our inventory at the store itself, and then they return it well now they've already paid us at that point in time so we wouldn't want to in issue a credit memo usually 
but instead in that case that's when we would use uh, the refund receipt which we talked about in a prior presentation now you also might have a situation where you want to give them like a credit that they can use in the future so instead of basically giving them their money back possibly you're saying something like well i'll give you a credit that you can then apply out to a future purchase or something like that now usually when that happens you would like to record the transaction when it happens meaning i want to record the transaction at the point in time they return the merchandise or that i'm that i'm reversing the sale because the journal entry should be input you would think at that point in time if you're committed to it if you think that they're actually going to take you up on the credit and therefore you could still actually issue a credit memo which will result in a negative accounts receivable which isn't exactly proper for accounting purposes but it works kind of from an internal bookkeeping purpose so we'll show that method uh, another way you could give someone a credit if you don't think that they're actually going to use the credit or you think that they possibly may or may not use the credit and so you don't actually have to record it at the point in time you're offering them the possibility of the credit then that's when you might use this delayed credit because the delayed credit as the name indicates will allow a credit in the system so we'll be able to see the credit in the system but it's not actually going to record anything until the point in time that you apply the credit say to a future purchase uh, like with an invoice so you might use that again if 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 you don't want to give them a check and you want to give them a credit but you don't want to record the transaction at this point in time you're only going to record it if they take you up on the actual offer of uh, the store credit at a future point any other time that you might want to give someone a credit as well if you give someone if you say i'm going to give you a a credit for future purchases then you might use the delayed credit method to do that because again it doesn't actually record the transaction at the point in time that you tell them about it right it'll record it once they once they take you up on the offer so the question then is should you be recording it at the at this point in time or should you re be reporting it when they take you up on the actual offer and that could depend on how likely from a, from a generally accepted accounting standpoint perspective how likely is it that they'll take you up on the offer and so on uh and so forth so let's take a look at the two options before i do i just want to point out this term credit as well because when we use the term credit uh it can get a little distorted note that from the customer side of things customers our customers uh when when they owe us money it's a debit we debit their account when they owe us money accounts receivable goes up with a debit so to us debits are like good on in that sense because that means that they owe us money and the asset is going up we did work and they owe us money if we credit their account that means to us we're bringing accounts receivable down so for us it's kind of like a bad thing because the, the asset is going down unless we got paid unless we got money for it but to the customer that's kind of like a good thing so when we say we're crediting their account we're usually saying we're reducing the amount that you owe us because we're crediting accounts receivable but then the term just starts to mean credit is good to customers customers see credits are as good decreasing their account or giving them a credit that they can apply to a future purchase a negative accounts receivable in essence that they can apply to a future purchase without paying for it fully right that would be the idea all right let's try to do uh the whole invoice process again so we'll do this again and we'll show the credit memo method and then we'll show this delayed payment thing so let's say customer number one again once again customer number one so generic so generic lame can't you come up with some like a name to make it a little more fun item one i would but then i'd misspell it and so then let's make this an inventory item just to make it a little bit more complex we're going to say that quantity on hand we'll put 10 on hand and as of the beginning of december reorder point i'll leave it blank description is going to be item number one sales price let's say we sell it for 180 let's say we purchase it item description purchase description for 100 therefore the the gain is going to be 80 and we'll have the sales tax involved as well just to make it a little bit more complex saving it 
there we have it. What's this going to do when we record it? It's an invoice. Increase in accounts receivable, 194.40, including the sales tax, including sales by the 180, just the amount that we charge, increasing the payable, sales tax payable, that is 14.40, and then decreasing the inventory by 100, the amount on the item that we said it was for, and then the cost of goods sold, income statement, expense account, in essence, increasing by 100, net impact on net income, 180 minus 100, $80, and the subledger will be impacted for customer number one, tracking by customer, and the subledger for inventory will be impacted, tracking the inventory by item. Whoo, let's check it out. Save it and close it and check it out. And let's go on over to the balance sheet. I'm gonna range change up top from a 10124 tab, 1231-24 tab, running it to refreshing it. And we're gonna go into the AR accounts receivable, close up this thingy, and there's the 194.40. Go back, let's go to the income statement, change in the range in 010124 tab, 1231-24 tab, running to refreshing, there's the 180. We can also see the cost of goods sold went up by 100, the difference being the $80. On the balance sheet, we know the income, the inventory account also went down by the $100 cost back. And then the, the uh, uh, sales tax payable, board of equalization, the board of equalization, 1440. Okay, so then we also can see that we have a subledger for accounts receivable. Let's open that, tab into the right, right clicking, duplicating. I'm going to go to the reports on the left hand side and then close up the hand boogie, scroll down who owes you. We're looking for the customer balance detail. And then we're going to say there's customer number one. There's the 19440. The total here, 6,045.92, tying out to what's on the balance sheet. 6,000, what? Uh, the total is 5,475.92. Over here, 5,475.92. Let's go back to the tab to the right, right click again, open up another report duplicating. So we can look at the inventory subledger report, which is also important. Reports on the left. Closing up the hand boogie. I'm going to search this time for inventory valuation summary. And let's bring it on up to 1231.24, running it to refreshing it. There's our nine units because we sold one of them. We're at a total of 149.624, tying out to the balance sheet at 149.625. 25. What did I get the four? I don't know. So I think that ties out. Okay, so so there it is. Now, if they so let's go internally, tab to the left, sales tab, close in the hand boogie and go into the customers and we can see there's customer number 1 and we can see there's the invoice. Now, if they've returned it at this point in time, they had not yet paid us, then that's when the credit memo would work perfectly as we saw in prior presentation, because the credit memo is going to reverse the accounts receivable. But let's imagine that they did pay us. So let's say they received the payment and then they're going to want like a credit of some kind. So they received the payment. Let's say it happened on the second, the payment method, whatever. Let's just make it a check reference number, check number, undeposited funds. Let's put it directly into the checking account. There's the invoice. What's the receive payment going to do? It's going to put it into the checking account and the other side is going to decrease the accounts receivable, no impact on net income. This is the standard process, which would normally happen. Save it and close it. We'll check it out, go into the balance sheet and run it to refresh it. We're going to say checking account. Let's check it out. And uh, uh, there's the payment 194.40 going back. Accounts receivable, AR, R is now netting out, goes up, goes down, looks correct. Let's go back to the internal documentation. We can see now the invoice has been paid, as we can see here, and is closed out. Now, what if they come back and return uh, the merchandise? Well, if they return the merchandise now, 
then we you would think that we'd have to actually issue them a check, right? You'd have to give them back the 194.40 if that's what we want to do. But we don't want to do it from the vendor side, or else I'd have to enter a vendor to pay the vendor, right? We want to keep it on the customer side of things, and that's why you might have the refund receipt uh, that we talked about last time. So we might process a refund receipt if we have to pay them back now. But what if we say, well, well, we're not going to pay you back. Uh, at this point in time, uh, what what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll just give you a credit, right? We'll give you a credit for a future purchase at some future point in time. So there's a couple ways we can do that. We could we could give them a credit memo, which will reverse the accounts receivable, even though it's already been paid, which will result in a negative accounts receivable, which isn't exactly proper because we'd like to have if we did that way, we'd like to have a positive liability account. But that actually works pretty well internally because we can see it processing internally. Or we can say, we'll give you a, a delayed credit. Now the delayed credit will not actually record something when we, when we record it here. So if we really expect them to take us up on the offer of the delayed credit, you would think that we would want to have to actually record it at this point in time as a liability or at least a negative receivable. But if we have some if we have some odds that they're not going to take us up on it, then maybe the appropriate thing would be to say it's a delayed credit because we're not thinking they're likely to take us up on it. And if they do, we will record it at the future point. You see the difference here. The question is, do I have to record the liability now that I've committed to or not? And from a generally accepted accounting standpoint, that would most likely depend upon how likely it is that they would that they're going to take you up on uh, on the offer uh, that, that you have. So let's first start with a credit memo. I'll show you what, what I'm talking about here. So let's say we entered a credit memo. I'm gonna say this is customer number one. Now they already paid us, but I'm still gonna issue a credit memo to result in a negative accounts receivable. So we'll say that this is gonna be item one. And so so there we have it. And there's the item number one. And we have the same issue we had last time, whereas this is going to reverse everything exactly. If you don't want it reversing to the sales, negative sales, you could create the second one here, which I would call sales returns and allowances or something like that. Copy it. I'm going to tab. I'm going to make this a service item. And we're going to say the description is that, but it's going to go to an, an account a new account, which I'm going to call a, a income account, other primary sales returns and allowances. So I'm going to say, okay, boom. And then here, I'm going to put the 180 down here. And I'm going to not put it up top, I'm going to say that this is just going to be zero. So this will reverse everything uh, it still comes out to the same dollar amount. It's going to reverse everything, but this item will reverse it to the proper income account. And this line item still being here means that they're going to return the inventory and we're putting the inventory back on the books. If we're not getting the inventory back and we just want to issue a negative accounts receivable, we would delete this line item and we would just do this line item, which would result in the negative credit so let me show you what i mean here let's say save and close it and so if i go on over to the balance sheet now we can say okay run it and now we've got uh the accounts receivable if i go into the accounts receivable we can see it already we have the invoice and the payment already matched out but now we have this other credit resulting in a negative accounts receivable for this period, or at least for that particular customer, which again, isn't properly correct because it should be a positive liability. This would be similar to a situation where you had like unearned revenue, right? So it's where you have this issue of having a negative accounts receivable or a positive liability. But from a bookkeeping standpoint, that works well. And you could adjust it at the end of the period if it's still outstanding, if they didn't take it, take you up on the offer before the end of the period, the end of the month, for example, by doing an adjusting entry. So if I go back on over, the, there's that. The other side's going to income. So let's run this one. 
And so now you can see that we had the sales and then it reversed it into sales returns and allowances. And then on the cost of goods sold side of things, it reversed the cost of goods sold as well because they returned the inventory. So I'm gonna go back and then back to the balance sheet. We also see that the sales tax down below has been reversed. So we had to deal the sales tax, that's been reversed. And then if I go back on up to the inventory, we can see the inventory has now been reversed and that's good. And then if I go to the sub ledger for accounts receivable and run it to refresh it, now we've got, we've got customer one has a negative amount with a credit memo hanging out there. Again, not exactly correct, because it should be a positive liability, but it's easy to track tied into the customer side of things from an internal perspective. And then if I go to the, the, the inventory, we now have 10 inventory units back on hand because they returned it, 1,596.25, matching what's on the balance sheet, 1,596.25. If I go internally to the tab to the left, then we can see in this, cust in this area, we had we can see exactly what happened this is why this works pretty well because you have the invoice you have the payment and then you have the credit memo which says it's unapplied so although it's not exactly correct on the on the financials because it results in that negative receivable in other words the receivables is understated by 194.40 on the balance sheet and in, instead we should have a liability but from an internal perspective, the negative receivable is easier to do because then it tracks it within the accounts receivable area, which is where we want it. Because if I then make another uh, another invoice, I can apply the credit to it, right? So let's say let's say later on they they purchase something and we apply the credit to it. I could say, okay, we want a new invoice, and then we're going to say this is going to be for customer number one, and do, do, this happened on the third, let's say. And then we're we're going to be giving them an item, uh, let's say item two this time. And let's let's say it's a different item we're giving them. And we're gonna say that, that this is item two, sales price is gonna be 200, let's say, and income account, sales tax still applied. The cost is gonna be, uh, uh, let's say 120 for our item. Okay, so I'm gonna say, and I have to put 10 on hand and boom. So we're gonna put them on hand so we could sell it again. Boom. So now we're gonna sell uh, one of those items. So I'm gonna record it and then see if I can apply the credit to it. So it's kind of a two-step process. So I'm gonna save it and close it. And so, so now you can see here that if I go back into the invoice, if I go back into it, it says partially paid, right? So if I go back into it, well, let's do it this way. Let's go into the edit over here. Then now I can see down here that it's been uh, partially paid and they put the amount received, the 194.40 from the credit memo. They applied it out properly over here. So, so that's kind of nice. And notice if they didn't do that automatically, notice down here it says uh, credit created by QuickBooks Online to link credits to charges. So what it did is it made a payment form uh, that linked these two out. Let's edit to view it. And so now we have a receive payment, which is usually the next thing you have on an invoice. But instead of receiving money that's gonna go into a checking account it was just tied out to the credit this is how they linked those two things together so we can record not only the transaction but also link it internally so this works really nicely internally to see everything that's happening even though it still results in that negative receivable so if i go back up top now and i run the report again and i go into my my accounts receivable you can see the, the activity now going in and out of the accounts receivable. And if I go into my sub ledger over here and I run my sub ledger, then uh, we can see that uh, we have the customer number one has a 2160 
remaining balance within it. So now we don't have that negative receivable. It's just a timing difference if they take you up on the actual payment of uh, the credit that was in there. All right, let's go back on over. And now let's think of it. Let's think of using the delayed payment. So let's do again. I'm going to this time I'm going to say that we have let's say we had a sales receipt. So we're at a cash register and we did a sales receipt. And let's say this is customer number two. And we're going to say, okay. And this happened, let's say on four. And we're going to say the payment method was a check and do 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 do. And it's going into the checking account. And let's do item number one again, item number one. So now they're paying us at the point in time we do it. What's this going to do? It's going to increase not the accounts receivable, but go right into the checking account instead. And then the other side's going to be that's for the full 194. The other side's going to revenue 180. Now let's actually make this in February so we could see a month by month February. And the other side's going to be going to revenue and then sales tax on a payable 1440. Inventory is going to be going uh, down and cost of goods sold going up. Net impact on net income 180 minus 100 or 80. Let's save it and close it and check that balance sheet. Run it. We're going to go into the AR. So now we have another accounts receivable. Uh, for the invoice, is it there? Hold on a second. Let's run it again and go into it. And well, it's not in that accounts receivable. Go back, go back. It's in the checking account. We went in the checking account for so so there it is uh, for the 194 sales receipt. The other side's going to the profit and loss. Let's run it this time month by month and run it. And so now we've got the 180, there's the cost of goods sold, and then the inventory is impacted as well. And so we already got paid again. So we're in essence in the same situation as if we had an invoice and then we got paid. Now, now let's go in internally to the sales. Let's go into customer number two, close up the ham boogie. And now we're gonna say, now let's say that they want their money back or whatever. Now I'm not gonna deal with, so, so this time, we'll say, let's use a delayed credit. So the delayed credit here, which won't actually record anything at this point in time, but will record it when they take us up on, on it. So customer number two, and we'll say this happens on, let's say, 03, let's say uh, 0124, and this will be item, let's put the item uh, number uh, one again. And so there it applies out. So it's only showing the 180, not the sales tax at this time because it's not actually recording anything. And therefore, even though that has the sales tax clicked off, it's not gonna record anything with relation to the sales tax until they basically take us up on the offer. So if I was to say save and close then, then you could see in here, if I close the hand bogey, that you have uh, the credit that is in here. This one's already been paid and now we have this credit. Now, if I go back on over here, nothing's been recorded in like accounts receivable for this customer. I don't believe it's there. And if I go to my sub ledger, run it, nothing's there. So, so you can see that we don't end up with this negative, this negative amount in here, which is kind of good. But on the other hand, the question is, should be, we be recording it or not? because a negative receivable, although it should be a positive liability, is still better than not recording anything at all if we're supposed to be recording it at this point in time, right? So this would, you'd wanna use this if, if you think they're not, maybe not gonna take you up on it so it doesn't actually record anything until, until they take you up on it, but you can see it internally in here or possibly like if, again, if you're trying to give someone, if they got a, if they got a coupon or something like that and or whatever, and you wanted to enter it into the system, but they haven't actually uh, actually taken you up on the coupon, but you wanna mark it down so that if they did, you have it in the system so that you can see it, but it hasn't recorded anything, something like that is where you might use this method. So then if I was to make an invoice for this client, I could say make an invoice 
and it's, it looks a little tricky because it, it's trying to pull in this credit item over here. And also note that I don't think you can pull in like just part of the credit. So this is also, you have to be careful because if, if the credit was, like if you're paying for something that was a hundred, uh, a fa like a hundred dollars and the credit for was for 180, then, then, you know, that might cause a problem. Let's, let's check it out. So if I go down here and say, this is going to happen on, let's say, oh, four, oh, one, two, four. And, and let's say that we purchased uh, something that costs more, like we said, item, or let's say it costs less. Let's say service item. I'll say tab. I'll make a service item. Duh, duh, and we'll say, duh, duh, let's say it would cost $100 for the service item and taxable. We'll keep it at taxable, I guess. We'll say save it. And so, so there we have it. And then when I pull in this credit, it's going to actually add it into the line item instead of like down here, like we saw with the credits before. So if I say add this, it, it adds it in here as a line item. So now we've got item one negative and it's linked up. So notice this item that we set up here also is going to uh, affect the inventory, I believe as well. So you have to be careful with the inventory if they returned the inventory, if you want them to be dealing with the inventory or not. Otherwise you might want to set up an, just an item that is for this, this particular process of the delayed credit. Okay, so then, so now we have uh, these two, these two, it still comes up with a negative 86 and you end up with a negative sales tax. So that's a little bit wonky, right? Because what you'd want to do is if this was higher, if this was 200, then, then everything would work out okay and this would basically clear out. But let's just follow this through if it was lower uh, 100. And just to check it out, I'm going to save it and close it. And it says enter a transaction amount is zero or greater. See, it's causing it's causing us a problem to record it. So you have to be careful about that as well. It's going to be diff more difficult to apply out like a partial credit. So I'm going to bring it back up to 200. And so now it's at it's at uh, 200. And then it, and then it nets out to 20. And then the sales tax is applied. So let's save it and close it. And so now, now it's basically uh, recording that item. And again, if I go into that invoice, it shows up in the line items of the invoice and with the attachment instead of basically down below, like we, were, we saw before in the credit. So then if I go back on over to the balance sheet, run it to uh, refresh it, and I go into the accounts receivable, then we can see that amount of the invoice being in there. And again, it's a little bit kind of a little bit weird because again, it doesn't record the whole invoice and then apply the credit because it's applying the credit at the same time in the top part of the form. So it's only showing us the net amount uh, that's pulling into the financial statements. So I'm going to, and that's because it's recording it at this point in time, instead of recording, you know, the credit beforehand, like we saw with the credit memo. And then on the profit and loss, let's run the profit and loss. We can see uh, the 180 minus the 200. It's being recorded that way because we made a service item for 200. And then when we reversed the, 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 the credit item, it was for an inventory item. So these are the two sales. So that's the $20 net that was recorded. And it did reverse the cost of goods sold as well. And so it returned the inventory. If I go back to the first tab, it pulled in the sales tax. So if I go into the sales tax, we can see that uh, within here. And then if I go back to the inventory, inventory, we can see the impact on uh, the inventory going in and out uh, as well. So let's go back on over. And it also adjusted the inventory ledger over here. So that's the general idea. So if I go back on over to the first tab, note that the general process would be if if you're trying to give a credit to someone, the credit memo would be used if you're trying to reverse the accounts receivable. If they already paid you, 
with an invoice or a sales receipt, you could still use the credit memo because it'll record the transaction and leave the credit, which will be a negative receivable on the books, but it'll be nice and easy to, to track internally from the bookkeeping standpoint where you can apply the future that credit to a future purchase uh, if you want to do a future purchase or if you want to actually give them their money back, that's when you would use the refund receipt. And if you want to give someone the potential to apply a credit in the future that won't actually record the liability or a negative receivable at the point in time that you're offering it to them, which again would probably only be the proper thing to do if it's likely that they're not going to take you up on the offer or like a coupon situation uh, or something like that, where because because then you don't know if they're actually going to do it or not, and therefore you might not have the obligation to record it on the financial statements at this point in time. Uh, so in that case, then you might do a delayed credit uh, of, of some kind, which means you're going to see the credit there, uh, but it won't record it until the future point in time when they take you up on the on on the offer.